Good morning. Good morning. So lovely to see you all here. Notice some of our uh, spring birds are starting to come back. Because I think maybe it's spring. For a while I thought those two nice days in February was summer and it was over. But maybe there's more. Well, it is lovely to have you here with us in the sanctuary. It is lovely to have you joining us via Zoom online. And lovely that you would let us join you in wherever you are. Let us come into your space. Thank you. As we all come into the space that the creator of the universe has made for us. And uh, for those of you who are in the building and on Zoom, it's a special treat for you as we have joining us the Reverend Dr. Rob Hagen again, who will be bringing us the word and immediately after worship, um, providing another workshop in legacy giving. He'll tell you more about that. Uh, but look forward to all these gracious gifts that are displayed before us today. And know that whoever you are, Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This is a place of holy welcome where we are all doing our best to walk the way of Jesus Christ, the risen one. So let us worship this God together. That's great. It is uh, good to be here uh, at Chapel by the Sea to be with you. Once again, I was here about uh, five weeks ago and uh, filling the pulpit and talking about how we can communicate our core values to the next generation. So I'm here also uh, in this point to say how can we communicate not only our core values to the next generation, not only what we have learned, but now what we have earned so that we can pass that on, not only to our heirs, but also the heirs in Christ in uh, this congregation. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace that goes ever before us. We ask that you illuminate this text that is so important in the life of the church. Thank you, Father, for your love that has reached out to Zacchaeus and transformed his life, going from success to significance, from transaction to transformation. Thank you again for this time. And we ask that the word will go forth and return to you full and acceptable in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, before I continue, just to give you a little bit of introduction, uh, I am Rob Hagen. I'm celebrating my 40th uh, year of ordination, and uh, it's a joy to uh, be in ministry. I serve two churches, one in Fresno, California, the other in Kennewick, Washington, which is just a little bit uh, east of here. Served there for 25 years. And now I'm part of the foundation. The foundation has been around since uh, 1799, working with churches, working with donors, working with people like you to how they uh, can communicate their core values and what they believe to the next generation in a variety of ways. And so with that in mind, we come to this very, very important passage. You know, if you go back to the churches of let's say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your mind's eye, let's look at kind of the, the campus of each one of those. And on Matthew's campus, the largest uh, room is the, uh, the continuing ed room because Matthew is all about teaching the church about Jesus being the Messiah. So the Christian ed room, so you go back to, let's say, Mark. And what is the largest thing on Mark's campus? That's the cross, because Mark's all about discipleship and carrying your cross. If you go back to the Gospel of John and go in your mind's eye to his campus, it's the sanctuary, because here you have eternity, kind of like the bank sign. Remember those old bank signs time? And he, uh, uh, you'd have dates and maybe time in those bank signs and it turns and revolves around like this. Well, in Gospel of John, it's time and eternity, time and eternity. In the Gospel of Luke, it's the Fellowship Hall. Because Luke wants everybody to come into the Fellowship Hall. So that's why you have the Good Samaritan. That's why you have the Prodigal Son. 
And that's why you have Zacchaeus that are only in the Gospel of Luke. So here, the story of Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short, a short man, he could, not be, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must or it is necessary for me to stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him, welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Amen. Last time I was here, I mentioned the heliotropic principle. And the heliotropic uh, principle is a principle of leadership. That is, every living organism is gravi is gra uh, gravitates to the most powerful force around it, whether that's negative or positive. And I have found that people are that gravitational pull when they are generous and when they are looking at parts of their life that they want to make sure that the, uh, that the next generation understands. So that's where all of a sudden people have seen that they've gone from success accumulating to significance and sharing that with others. Someone said, Rob, why does the church always ask for money? And I said, well, let me tell you, George. Guess what? When you go to the, the store, you buy something, you take it to the cash res register, and what do you have to do after they weigh it, after they scan it? You have to pay for it, right? When you go to the doctor, you have to pay what's called a copay before you get to see the doctor. But when it comes to the church, it's different. You can enjoy potlucks. You can enjoy great uh, organ organ uh, playing, you can gr uh, enjoy great singing, great preaching, without paying anything. In fact, it's so good, there are other people that will pay for you. <laughs> but guess what, George? If you hang around enough in the church, you'll see that success is not enough to build a life upon. It's significant. If you hang around the church, you'll see that and you'll be drawn into that. Sam, I'm glad that you mentioned that today is Anselm's. We remember Anselm and, and his death. But yesterday, April 20th, was the feast of Zacchaeus. I mean, uh, Zach uh, Zacchaeus, yes. Um, and he was a patron saint of the church. And later on, according to tradition, he was the bishop of Caesarea. So you can see that he has gone from success to significance in the life of the Roman Catholic Church and Greek Orthodox Church. And that traveling we can see today. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Not only was he considered a traitor by the Jewish people, but also he was a collaborator. So if I would go to, if I was a tax collector, and if I would go to your farm, uh, I would assess everything, not only in my understanding of what it, the Romans wanted, but also how can I take my cut, right? And so uh, I go to your farm and you say, well, Rob, uh, here's a little bit more money. Don't tell them about the sheep in the back 40, okay? And I'll give you this. Say, okay, thank you. So the Roman tax collector comes and he says to me, okay, what is the tax 
allocation for this farm. Well, here's the tax here. And he goes, great. And here's your cut. He goes, oh, by the way, this guy has another uh, flock in the North 40. Oh, we need to tax that as well. So I get my cut from that, but also I get the bribe. So I become very, very wealthy, but in the eyes of other people, I am wretched. So you can see the understanding that why people looked at tax collectors, especially Zacchaeus, the chief collect tax collector, as someone that they didn't want to have any part of, that he was disenfranchised from that society. In fact, Jericho was a hard town, one of the oldest cities in the world. And what it had is that it had balsam. It would have this fragrant sort of um, uh, mineral where people could come and they could uh, take that and extract that and make spices and perfume. So it's one of the key uh, export and import cities of the world, even though he was inland. It was a tough town. Even in fact, in, from Jericho to Jerusalem, was known for a hard road and bandits, and that's where the Good Samaritan found this man half dead because of such a, a violent road from Jericho to Jerusalem. So Zacchaeus was this uh, disenfranchised person. But he wanted to see Jesus. And so as Jesus was coming to go to Jerusalem, going through Jericho, there's probably a crowd that formed and they were, this parade was going through Jericho and then Jesus diverted to the sycamore tree and in other religions, sycamore trees were considered wisdom. In fact, they were part of kind of the regeneration pattern of that religion. Indigenous Indians look at sycamore as part of a wisdom sort of tradition. And so here he is climbing the sycamore tree and this fig tree and Jesus says it is necessary for me to go to you so that I can come to dinner why is it necessary well again what Sam said this morning is very important did God did Jesus continue uh, condition God into being gracious or was God already gracious and Jesus showed Israel how gracious he was that's very important because if you look at the Ten Commandments, you will see, well, uh, isn't, you know, here, uh, Zacchaeus had broke every commandment. Yeah, probably. At least some of them, like we have. But God still loves him. And the first commandment in the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt have no other God before me. The first one is, I am the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt with a strong hand. Therefore, <clears throat> It's called apodictic law. It's like when you come before a uh, pastor in, in weddings and you give your vows. It's a response to the love that it's already there. It's not case law like in Leviticus. If you do this, therefore that. That's why Jesus had to go to Zacchaeus to say, I want to make sure that you know that my love is unconditional. And Zacchaeus was surprised more than anyone, right? My love is unconditional because I seek those who are lost, those who feel disenfranchised, those who feel that they're not part of a community, those who are outcasts. Yes, even those who are collaborating with the enemy. Because what happens is there's a difference between chronos and Kairos time. Kronos time is what Zacchaeus lived by, right? He gathered taxes every day. He took his cut. He saw Jesus and he ran and he wanted to become a part of it. That's Kronos time. That's the time that you see on your wristwatch. But Kronos time is when Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and said, I want to come to dinner at your house. And all time seemed to stop, I bet, for Zacchaeus. Paul says, in the fullness of time, in Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, 
God sent his son. That time is Cairo's time. I ran an 11, a 10 mile race the other day and, and I was watching my top clock. You mean, I, and I have, a, I have a watch that keeps time when I run, right? And I look that down and say, oh, I've run about two miles in about, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes. And so I was running, keeping track of time. And then there was this lady who was ahead of me and she stopped. We ran around this beautiful lake. She stopped and took pictures. And I said, what are you doing? Aren't you looking at your time? Yes, she was. She was looking at Cairo's time. I was looking at Kronos time. She stopped and looked at the beauty. I had my head down running because I was on Kronos time. And when you have Cairo's time in your life, what happened to Zacchaeus is very important. Kairos time breaks barriers. When you're in Jesus' time, it breaks barriers against prejudice, against you thinking, maybe thinking that people are not worthy of the good news of Jesus Christ, or you're not. And Jesus said, I want to come to your house today. Not only he breaks barriers, but he gives you energy to fix what's wrong. And that's what Zacchaeus did. He gave back more than he had to do in terms of restitution. He met Jesus and went to dinner. And Luke kind of compresses it. I could imagine Luke and Jesus at dinner. And Jesus is talking with him about his life, about Zacchaeus' life. And said, you know, you need to do something about this. I love you. I've come to your home, which is a great act of hospitality on Zacchaeus's part. Thank you for that. And Zacchaeus says, whatever it takes, I will do. In fact, he gave back more. Then the third thing that Zacchaeus did in this Kairos time is he said, I don't want to be the best in the world anymore. I want to be the best for the world. I don't want to be the best in the world, the success that I'm trying to achieve, no matter what the cost, I want to be the best for the world. I want to be significantly a part of Christ's kingdom. And that's what we say today. Do we want to be the best in the world or the best for the world? And when you're in the Kairos moment, that becomes, shapes and becomes your life story and shapes your life. I was at Boise Presbytery, and you know, Presbytery meetings can be kind of boring. <laughs> but this one I'll remember for the rest of my life. They have, um, they share a camp uh, with Kendall Presbytery, and the, the director of the camp came up and kind of was sharing stories about, about the summer, and she shared this story about the junior high camp. And uh, the junior high camp was great, and Thursday night, uh, they wanted to wash the kids' feet, the staff. And so they didn't. So these junior high kids, you know, who, if you've worked with junior high kids, they're squirrely, they're, you know, they're, they're uncontrollable at times. So these kids were sitting up in chairs right here, and the staff started to wash their feet, and they giggled, and they, uh, uh, five minutes later, there was no sound at all. Some of them, the junior high kids, started to cry. Because no one had ever done that for them before. And so after the staff did that, they stood up and they said, can we wash your feet? Kairos moment, right? They didn't want to be the best in the world, but to be the best for the world significantly. And so the staff said, okay. So they washed the staff's feet. And these junior high kids stood up again and said, can we wash somebody else's feet? And so they went over to the cook's house and the cook opened their door and here were 30 pair of eyes staring at them and said, can we wash your feet? <laughs> okay. And so they went in and washed his feet and his wife's feet. Then they went over to the janitor and then they went over to the groundskeeper and they washed people's feet that evening. And it was a significant thing that nobody else will forget. That's a Kairos moment. That's a Kairos moment. No, man, no wonder 
Zacchaeus is a patron saint of those who need to be in a Kairos moment. And there's a feast named after him. Do you need to be touched today? Do you need to talk about what the future is for you in terms of how you can leave your legacy? Zacchaeus left his in a very dramatic way. Are you living according to time? Or are you living according to God's time? Kairos time. Kairos time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Zacchaeus. Thank you for his life, what it meant to us, and what it still means, and how we can, Father, go from success to significance. That's not an easy turn to do. And it's not an easy thing for us. And it probably wasn't easy for Zacchaeus until he came into that Kairos time. As we live in, Father, that Kronos time, working every day and getting up, you bring to us, Father, that love that is not just a case love, if you do this and I'll love you, but because you have made a vow towards us, we want to make sure that you're the first in our lives. We want to make sure, Father, that we follow you. We want to make sure, Father, that we don't take things from other people. And so we want to follow you according to that type of law that you have given to us that frees us. Because it is a marriage between us and you. So we thank you, Father, for the vows that you have given to us. Jesus didn't come to uh, make you gracious. You already have been gracious to us because it's necessary for you to come to our home. It is necessary for us. Thank you, Father, you've demonstrated your love. We pray this in the strong and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.